Most of the Kotars were sheep herders. Who would think a bunch of young sheep herders would develop a coat that nobody has ever broken? The Marine Corps didn't break it. The Baptist Church didn't break it. The Navajo tribe hasn't broken it yet. Nobody has ever broken it. I was aware of the Code Talkers and the fact that they, were, they had existed. There was um, a man by the name of Philip Johnston called me one evening from La Mesa, California. I have some material, some archival material that I would like to donate to the Navajo tribe. I had no idea who he was or what he had. After listening for about six hours, his story about the origin and the development of the Navajo Code Talkers. Some of the Marines that were down at Camp Elliott and Camp Pendleton were friends of his and had been talking about the problem that they were having uh, and coming up with instantaneous codes and how to develop a code where you have a very fluid front line, not time you to lay down lines or secure your, your uh, signal people and have a code that is instantaneous. So he suggested the Navajo language. The only reason it was picked is because Philip Johnson was familiar with Navajo and said, why don't you use Navajo? Throughout the war, they used Choctaws, they had Hopi, they had some Zunis. Only the Navajos put it into a code. And you can thank Philip Johnston for that again. Because once he convinced the Marine Corps to do this, they authorized 30, uh, to recruit 30 men, a platoon. 29 show up, 29 go down to Phoenix, they get sent over to uh, Camp Pendleton, they go through their basic training, like anybody else, but they went through as a Navajo unit. First time that it ever happened. Not integrated with other, other groups. So four out of, out of those 29 stayed back and started to then design a code. To me, it was very difficult because Navajo language, it's not a written language. And it, it's an Athabascan language. There's an Athabascan tribe in Alaska, and we speak that language. To me, it was very difficult and only 421 passed that code during the process of the war. Now there were about 1,500 Navajos in the, in the Marines. So this is, I think, another fallacy that every Navajo that went into the service in World War II became a code talker. That's not true. They were in the Seabees, they were in the Army Air Corps, they were many of them in the Army, uh, in the Navy, uh, as well as in the Marines, just as a, as a private in the Marines. December 7th of 41, the Japanese struck our shore. The tentacles of the Axis powers that pull this land to war. Down in the mile high western desert, homeland to the Navajo. Marines are looking for a few good men to go. As bombs fell on Pearl Harbor, the Navajo as a nation were still recovering from the dislocation of the Long Walk, the 300-mile forced march across New Mexico to Bosque Redondo in 1864. Uh, 1864, when Kit Carson was commissioned to round them up and herd them off to uh, Fort Sumner, New Mexico. I've been there and it's it's a godforsaken area. Uh, the Perca River there is, is saline, and, and it's, uh, they try to develop these folks into uh, farmers. Uh, they're pestilence of one sort or another, everything from drought to uh, cut worms and just destroy the crops. The uh, contractors who brought food in for them, at that because there were some 8,000 of them incarcerated there at, at Toil Day, uh, they ripped off the government, ripped off the Navajos, 
Even though the government mistreated the Navajo, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, hundreds of young Navajo volunteered for military service. They had a sense of loyalty to the larger U.S. After Pearl Harbor, and word got out through these uh, boxes that talked, the, the wind talker boxes, the radio, men would appear at the trading post ready to sign up with their rifle in hand, ready to go. The governor didn't really understand us, what kind of people we were. They didn't treat us nice, sent our grandparents to Fort Sumner. That's something. Now, they understand it now, and I am proud of it, what we did, and every Navajo should be proud of it. <coughs> that we have contributed our language for, for victory for our country. However, before the Navajo could use their language for victory for their country, they had one more requirement to complete. One of the requirements in the Marine Corps that you know how to swim. So all these guys, when, when they asked they recruit us with their ass and can you swim? No, Navajo's, yeah, I can swim, you know. And there's no water on the reservation. <laughs> and, <laughs> so one day the swimming qualification came up. They have a Olympic sized pool on San Diego. You have to swim across back, swim across back, swim across back to qualify. So one day they lined us up and uh, they blew the whistle, we jumped in, both of us, we didn't know how to swim, so. They blew the whistle, we jumped in, and I dog paddled all the way across. Coming back, about halfway, I went down. And I pushed myself from, from the bottom of the pool, but pushed myself up. And I looked at the lifeguard. He was looking the other way, you know, act like he didn't see me. I went down again. So I came back again four times. Every time I come up, he'd be looking the other way. Then the fourth time I, I came up, by that time my arms were just like this. I couldn't stay uh, horizontal, I was just vertical like this. And, and I look up there and he, he saw me, he said, just kind of smiling, you know. <laughs> What's the matter, Chief, he says. <laughs> I said, help. <laughs> I was so tired, I couldn't. And they jump in and pull me out. The next day, my name was on the list, casualty company, <laughs> non-swimmers, big print, and, and we had a swimming class every day. We had to go swimming every day until we qualified. So that, that's, uh, and to make it worse, uh, this uh, reconnaissance company, you had to learn to swim underwater. We didn't know that when we volunteered. In the hot, dry southwestern sun, the volunteers took the oath to defend this U.S. soul, though none of them could vote. From their mother tongue, they were told to devise a code that they alone, the Navajo, would know. We had to memorize about something like over 211 words. We uh, studied that every day into the night, and we had a lot of security there, and uh, we had to uh, swear to all the secrecy. And this was one of the uh, top secret in the war. We started uh, studying the code, and. Uh, they told us that code was top secret right from the uh, top, right from the start. When we're in the class, we study code. You don't take any notes outside that door. Everything stays in here. People ask us, how long did, how long did it take you to train as code tucker? I tell them, we train right from the beginning through boot camp. After boot camp, I mean, uh, after boot camp, through advanced training, and then uh, we go to a big island for uh, training. And then during the war, we, we, still, we still learn things. In other words, training never ends for, for the coat tuggers because new words come out. But after you learn it, it was easy because it came in three, three forms, three areas. 
anything that flew were named after different types of birds. Anything on the ground were named after those things were on the ground. Anything that float or submerged were named after different type of fish. So when the message coming over, Coat Talker says something about bird, you know it's an airplane. Something on the ground, you know something on the ground. They say fish, you know it's a ship or some kind of a submarine. As the paint shimmered in the elder's eyes, the bitterness swept aside. To see the young sons join the ranks of the stars and stripes. From Guadalcanal to Okinawa, with their weapon was their speech. That the church and boarding schools refused to teach. After completing boot camp and their initial Code Talker school, the Navajo left Camp Pendleton and went to various units for further training. We moved down to uh, San Diego Harbor where we boarded uh, one of these big uh, troop ships called Mount Vernon. So we set sail from there and it took us about two weeks to get down to New Zealand. And we had additional training down there. We secretly uh, <clears throat> go through our uh, coat, you know, we practice down there. And, uh, and we used mostly a uh, telephone, you know. Water canal was secured, and then we moved in to Water Canal. So we had additional training, you know, like jungle training. And um, we um, trained all through the summer of 1943, and then we were ready for combat. We had a bad landing that day. The water came up and the wave got real choppy and pushed a lot of those landing craft against uh, onto the beach, you know. We had a hard time trying to push them back into the water. While we're down there, uh, this, the Japanese Zeros came in from the north side. They had a base over there and they strafed that beach, you know, back and forth, you know. And, uh, Finally, they sent word out to the uh, fleet, you know, they were nearby, and those fighter planes came in and chased them away and shot them down. At first, the code talkers were not used because commanders did not trust a communication system not yet proven with such crucial and important information. But the code talkers proved themselves invaluable to the Marines. Up to this time, I haven't used the code yet. <clears throat> they were using the Marie code, you know, uh, all this time. They used this uh, little uh, machine they call a shackle cipher. They had to feed uh, uh, numbers and words into this little machine, you know, and get a message out of it. And uh, the second night, <clears throat> the message came in. The radio men were uh, taking care of that. An hour went by, two hours, three hours. Finally, uh, my foxhole partner came in and asked me, uh, could you help us? He said, uh, we can't get this message. So I called this code talker at the headquarters, you know, regiment headquarters, and asked him what was in the message. It was a short message. <clears throat> and uh, he gave it to me in less than uh, three minutes, you know. So that's how I got my job, you know, got the message. And from then on, they used me all through the rest of the uh, campaign, you know. My next campaign was Guam, and then the third campaign was Iwo, February 1945. Iwo Jima, the, uh, the Navajo code was really used uh, extensively. On the killing sands of Iwo Jima, Navajo jeans worked round the clock. Our Marines are pinned down on the beach by gunners drenched in rock. The strikes that turned the battle's tide were signaled by the tribe whose 
Mother tongue and spirit had survived. I know I was aboard ship with uh, 14 uh, boat talkers. Message was going out. This was the command ship where the admirals and the generals were. Even Secretary of War, Forstall, was aboard that ship. And we were sending messages, messages coming in. And three, two days, two days and two nights, just, we couldn't get any sleep. Sleep, I was, I was, thinking, I was, I was so glad to get off that ship. Of over 50,000 Navajo, only about 300 were selected as code talkers for very specific reasons. They knew Navajo and English. They came back and not only proved to the white society that it's important to know Navajo, but you can know Navajo, that it could be a, a valid contribution, but they also came back and told all these other Navajo kids, hey, it's also important to learn English. They could not have functioned as a code talker if they didn't have a real good grasp on English. The Navajo, despite their mistreatment, learned English, fought for their country, and were proud of their service. The problem was South that I did this um, service to my country, you know, and for my people. I, uh, I know it's, it's, it's hard, the war is rough, you know, but uh, I'm proud of myself. It's their patriotism that's not just worn on their sleeve, or they don't just say it to you because they think you want to hear it. These men, even on their own, if they're out in the middle of the field and the flag goes by, they start crying. They are more patriotic. This, and when they come right down and say, hey, this land is my land too. You know, I wasn't just going there to fight for America in general. I'm also fighting for my rights to be a, an American, my rights to be a Navajo. To listen to some of these guys talk about what patriotism and freedom <clears throat> means to them it gets me choked up. And, and they're not doing that just for your benefit. Uh, that's the way they feel. During World War II, their language and the code they created as Navajo talkers saved thousands of American soldiers, and in the process, they became heroes to the Navajo Nation. Navajos, like anybody, <clears throat> need heroes. And especially during the 80s and everything, when we were going through a very anti-hero part, uh, part in our culture, you know, trying to do it, you know, Daniel Boone wasn't really what he was cracked up to be. D Davy Crockett really wasn't killed at the Alamo. He tried to sneak out the back door. And, you know, it was all these efforts to downplay heroes. And I think that's, that's bad. Our, every culture needs somebody to look up to. And here we had a group of Navajos that young Navajos could look up to. Because of you, the us now, the us Native American people got our freedoms. Because of you, we got the right to vote. I am very proud to be Native American, and when I travel across the United States, I always say I am a part of the I am a part of Navajo. I am a part of the code talkers. I am a part of the unbre unbreakable code. I think they are seen as heroes. These are not mythical heroes. They have in their origin legends mythical heroes, uh, the hero twins, uh, a lot of things that, account, that in there is their way of, of accounting for nature as it is and, and themselves as they are. But here, very historic heroes. So, laiko do da itzo baka klish no ta ka shash Wallachi was a clean, yes, gosh, indeed, little stars and stripes on Sir Baji. A cone, D. A. Ya, the net, and the ish in it at it. The current generation of Navajo children are looking to their heroes for answers about war. The children were have been looking for. The smell of war, 
the touch of war, the taste of war. But they never felt the feeling of war. They never tasted the feeling of war. They never smelled the war. And they had to find those three to answer their questions. How does it feel? How does it taste? How, do, how does it smell? <laughs>